All right, thank you very much, Chair. Um, dear commanders, um, generals, excellencies, colleagues, distinguished audience, good morning to, to everyone. Um, this is uh, the last talk on this panel and uh, um, will then lead to the uh, syndicates. So I hope that uh, perhaps some of the comments might uh, inform also the discussions in the syndicates. I would like to thank uh, first the Sri Lankan Army for inviting me to participate in this year's uh, Colombo Defense Seminar. Um, and I thank you very much for the tremendous uh, hospitality that we have been receiving during our stay here. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to share with you a few thoughts on um, the spin that uh, I give, as my colleagues did, to the general topic on military readiness challenges in the contemporary security landscape. And that is a few thoughts on how investing in good security sector governance uh, and adapting the defense sector and, and overall security sector to changing security environments and challenges is a, is a very important um, ingredient of military uh, preparedness. Now, um, Overall, I would like to stress in my presentation that continuous security uh, sector development and, and reform along good governance principles, in other words, uh, adjustments to changing internal and external security environments, uh, is crucial to military preparedness. Um, this is a considerable task in any country, and every single country on this planet is going through development and reform process, uh, processes in the security sector at any given time. Uh, it's an ongoing process. It's not a, a project. It's a long-term journey. So this is a considerable task, and more so the case when such changes are also paralleled by changes to the political system, um, economic development, or post-conflict uh, rebuilding. So when adapting to changing security contexts, defense reform needs to be embedded in overall uh, security sector development and reform. So first of all, if I talk about the security sector, what and, and who is part of the security sector, and there's not always uh, an agreement on, on, on who that is. I mean, when we talk about the security sector, we don't just talk about the military or the defense sector alone. So we're talking about all those institutions in society uh, that provide uh, security and justice and those actors, institutions and legal frameworks that are entrusted with managing and overseeing the security providers. So and together they form a package kind of. They ensure that uh, uh, the population can enjoy a high quality uh, and accountable public service that provides uh, security to all in an efficient, in an effective and in an accountable manner. So if you look at some of these, the, the, the parts and the, the actors that we usually consider to be part of the security sector, we look at uh, uh, security actors and uh, uh, institutions at the state level, at the non-state level, and then the same in parallel, the management and governance and oversight bodies, also at the state and non-state level. And of course, uh, the state actors providing security include the defense forces, paramilitary forces, intelligence, secret services, uh, police in some countries, gendarmeries or armed police, border customs guards, the whole justice system, courts and, and, and prisons. Um, at the non-state level, there are also security actors that provide more or less security in a more or less accountable manner. Now we got private military and security companies that are sprawling around the planet uh, and are outnumbering in many cases the actual police, police forces. In conflict context, we got rebel groups and, and, and armed groups who are supposed to provide security or access to humanitarian assistance, uh, for instance, uh, in, in their pockets sort of of control where there is no government presence. And as we heard yesterday and discussed yesterday, um, there is agreement, disagreement uh, on, on, on how to treat uh, 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 rebel groups, insurgencies, uh, during peace processes, for example, as, as, as partners in negotiating post-conflict uh, uh, settlements and power sharing. 
Now, then there are political party militias. Uh, they're also traditional, informal providers of security, uh, village elders and, 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 and alike. And then, of course, on the other side, we have uh, the oversight and management actors at the state level, very importantly, the legal framework, constitution, laws, and so on, that define the, the mandates, the roles, the tasks of the security institutions. There's the executive, president, you know, prime minister, uh, uh, the, the ministries, power ministries, foreign uh, defense, uh, border, interior. There's a legislature, a uh, parliament, uh, usually with specialized committees that, that focus on, on uh, security institutions. Or then there are the ombuds offices, human rights commissioners, anti-corruption commissioners, and so on. And at the non-state level, also very importantly, um, NGOs, uh, uh, think tanks, uh, uh, the media that, that comment on, that observe uh, uh, the work of, of the security institutions, uh, uh, the business community in, in, in relation especially to, to private security actors. So it's a, it's a whole package, a quite comprehensive package of actors that provide a public service very similar to to the, uh, 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 for instance, the health sector or educational sector, where we want professionals who are well-trained, who do what they're supposed to do, who are praised for what they do, uh, and who receive continuing education, but also uh, are, are uh, given the means and, and, and the tools to do their work effectively, efficiency, uh, efficiently and accountably. Now, a security sector functions best when all its components adhere to some, some principles and usually the, we, we, we uh, uh, express them as the principles of good governance. And what are these principles and what do they mean when, when you apply them to uh, uh, the security sector? I'm sure most of you are, are, are familiar with these principles. Uh, uh, if, if, we, if we look at them in the security sector, participation for example means that security institutions and the people working in these institutions are representative of the population, of women, of men, uh, of all ethnic groups. So that's an important principle. Equity and inclusivity uh, it means, for example, that all members of society can join security institutions, that they can rise up the ranks without discrimination, um, that they're treated equally uh, uh, by the security institutions, that uh, everyone can participate in commenting on, on, on their work. And, and basically the population sees the security institutions, the military, police, other security institutions as, as their institutions you know, uh, that are providing an important public service. Then rule of law is important. It means impartial enforcement, of course, and also impartial adherence to the law. Uh, nobody, including the security providers, are above the law. Nobody enjoys impunity, um, and the legal framework has to reflect the aspirations of a modern, of, of a professional uh, uh, military or police or in, in, in intelligence and so on. It also means that the legal framework has to be, be adjusted uh, and to, to modern times and, and to professional services. Uh, in many countries that's not the case because they are quite outdated. Uh, transparency is an important issue. It means that civil authorities, civil society actors who are supposed to oversee, you know, have access to information about the work of the security institutions um, to the degree possible, you know, where we don't hit kind of the, the wall of, of national security where, where some information has to be held back for procurement, for instance, and, and uh, uh, other issues uh, need to be handled transparently. Responsiveness is important. Uh, it means the provision of professional, of timely delivery of security and justice uh, to everyone uh, uh, in rural areas, in urban areas, um, and a public service orientation, which sometimes uh, requires a bit of attitudinal change, you know, that uh, if we work in, an, in, the, in, in the security sector, security force serving the population. Um, consensus orientation is important, that the population that is behind the work uh, of the security institutions. There should be coherent policies and responsibilities um, based on inclusive, broad stakeholder consultation processes. The ownership, basically, of a society's security sector is, lies within the, the society. 
And if it's broadly supported, then there is also, uh, there is also confidence in, in faith uh, of the work of the security actors. Then effectiveness and efficiency is very important. Uh, we want effective professional management and delivery of services of security institutions and also smart and, and sustainable use of human capital and the financial resources that uh, uh, exist. But it also means that these resources need to be provided. We cannot expect uh, uh, security uh, forces to adjust and adapt to changing environments and uh, you know, develop new responses to, to new challenges if the means are not given uh, to do so. That's very important. Um, and finally, accountability is important. It means that internal accountability, but also accountability to democratic and civilian authorities, civil society, uh, uh, and, and the population at large. Um, security institutions need to explain uh, what, what they do and receive support uh, uh, from the population. Now, by promoting those uh, good governance principles, security institutions are accountable to the state, to the people, it's important, they're effective, efficient, affordable, uh, um, and they respect international, human, uh, uh, international norms, standards of human rights. They're legitimate in the eyes of, of, of all in, in society. And of course then uh, uh, enjoy uh, a strong reputation. You know. uh, so reforms of security institutions, including defense reform, offer a perfect chance to make improvements uh, along good governance principles in, in every society. Um, however, those reforms need to be driven by a thorough analysis of what is actually required, you know, what, what works um, and, and needs no change, you know, what, what does not work and could benefit from some uh, improvements. So it's necessary that, that reforms, adjustments in the security sector need to be based on thorough assessments and also assessments of current security situations. Um, so broad-based and inclusive security assessment needs to inform, for example, national security policy and, and, and strategy, which has proven to be very helpful in many societies who do have these national security policies and, and, and strategies as they inform then uh, defense strategies and, and, and policies. Um, now, uh, a national security policy defines a broad vision for national security uh, um, that is responsive to people's diverse needs. Then it provides guidance for effective policy implementation. Uh, it, it strengthens security sector efficiency and accountability, one of these principles, or some of these principles, builds domestic consensus on security provision, and then also enhances regional international confidence and, and cooperation, uh, and supports cooperation. There, there are no blueprints on, on, on how these, these national security uh, policy processes are, are supposed to be handled, um, but, but usually there are a number of phases. There's an inia initiation of the process, and then there are consultations. That's where the inclusive process uh, comes in. Uh, drafting, review, there's some sort of an approval sometimes by the parliament, uh, cabinet, dissemination to, to all institutions involved, implementation um, through a white paper, for example, within uh, the armed forces, and then importantly, monitoring and periodic uh, uh, reviews. Now, what are some of the threats that do change from time to time and that will require updated responses from the security sector, including the military? Uh, uh, now, yesterday we've talked about threats in the Asia-Pacific region. I'm, I'm uh, just mentioning a few more, more, more general threats that exist in, in the region that include internal threats like internal armed conf uh, conflicts, terrorism, transnational crimes, we heard a lot about yesterday, economic and, and social threats, including uh, social injustice, but then also external threats, overlapping territorial uh, uh, claims. Maritime threats, uh, including piracy or, or, or drug and human trafficking, um, proliferation of, of uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, threats of cybercrime, climate change and its negative consequences, military modernization that happens in neighboring states or that happens in very dominant states, hegemons in, in the region, uh, um, and of course transnational terrorism, transnational criminal organizations. 
so those are changing the security landscape as we have seen yesterday and, and, and need to be responded to. But, but, but how? And so revising objectives and capabilities to keep up with developing threats and changing threats is, is a constant challenge that needs to be met in, in all countries. Um, and as defense develops its capabilities to tackle these new threats and new security contexts, uh, um, it's important, again, that defense forces remain appropriate, adequate, accountable, and, and affordable. Defense reform must consider the government uh, um, that's responsible for, for guiding uh, uh, the nation, the army, and, and, and the people. So uh, uh, militaries must be responsive to the governance policies, uh, has to uh, uh, maintain its effectiveness, has to be responsive and to uh, a democratic security sector governance and its principles, and uh, uh, to ensure that defense policies also reflect uh, the will and the, the needs of, of the people. Now the question is who carries out those reforms? And quite often that is a, a question in most countries that go through on the one hand, these national security policy strategy processes that also develop then subsectoral strategies uh, for, for the security sector. N usually defense reform is best carried out by civilian ministries of defense, uh, um, but they have to have appropriate uh, civilian and military expertise to manage such a complex process and understand the process. Um, then a comprehensive process will consider both national and international actors, public-private institutions, basically the whole range of security sector actors. All branches of the armed forces are in involved, including the civilian personnel. Um, they're involved in planning and implementation of defense reform. Decision-making bodies like national security councils or defense commissions in parliaments, they formulate defense policies and strategies and and institutionalize democratic control also of defense. Ministries and departments of defense uh, oversee policy and work with other government agencies, kind of an interagency approach to implement reform uh, on their defense-related uh, uh, security roles. Uh, domestic security providers, police, intelligence services, border guards, customs officials cooperate with uh, uh, the armed forces. Um, and may need to adapt their, their own relationship to the needs of defense reform and new uh, defense strategies. Um, defense and security related committees in parliaments draft laws on defense. They oversee budgets very importantly um, and, and conduct inquiries if necessary. Uh, the military justice system helps ensure that armed forces are accountable, respect human rights, rule of law. Um, the media reports on defense issues. Think tanks provide independent research uh, and training, um, and political parties uh, develop their own defense policies. Um, local communities are involved in local governments uh, uh, when military forces are, for example, stationed. Um, private military and security companies or the defense industry uh, coordinate with the military uh, for security purposes or they might be involved in supporting defense reform. And, and multilateral bodies, uh, donor organizations, regional organizations might play a, a, a role in reform through providing funds, uh, support, and expertise. So it's, it's, it's not an easy task and it affects a wide range of actors uh, uh, once it is decided that it is necessary to, to, to change one's own institutional uh, 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 structure or uh, policy and, and technical and, and, and training and, and tactical uh, uh, direction in response to, to new threats. So staying true to good security sector governance principles helps the security sector, most prominently among them the military, to remain compatible with the changing society, political system, and internal and external security environments. Um, before I, I, I wrap up, I just want to uh, mention an activity that we have now been, been launching uh, um, to, to uh, establish an Asia-Pacific security sector governance network, a regional network across South Asia, Southeast Asia, and East Asia, where we collaborate with institutions that provide expertise on security sector governance in all countries 
to, to allow for experience sharing and, and, and joint learning. And in fact, next week we are meeting outside of Kathmandu with delegations from all South uh, Asian uh, uh, states to, to look at countries' security sector governance, uh, um, uh, look at uh, uh, joint and, and challenges and see if uh, one can learn from, from each other's uh, uh, experiences. Now, in closing, then, please let me uh, reiterate a, a couple of points. Um, military preparedness requires constant reassessment and readjustment to new security realities. Um, a thorough security sector review might help in suggesting steps that could be taken to assure a better match between the threats that exist on the one hand and the responses and preparedness on the other. Providing security as a public secure, uh, service requires coordination and often cooperation among a wide range of actors, uh, including those providing management and oversight. It's important to undertake threat analysis through an inclusive process um, that results then in a national security policy uh, and strategy that informs uh, subsectoral uh, 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 policies. So that includes an honest look at the suitability to meet new threat environments by the current security system and response mechanisms. Um, and it's important to continuously invest in making responses compatible with prevalent threats. Um, it's also, of course, important as a final point to search for regional solutions. Um, and, and that's why this is such a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, you know, platform for, for exploring exactly those, those, those regional solutions and, and develop ties. And it's important to invest in mainstreaming good security sector governance throughout the security sector to make this uh, a, a successful in, endeavor. So thank you very much. Thank you.